My chief military secretary whispered to me the warning, an assault, but not from beyond the recitive city walls. I must hurry. I grabbed my sword, though later I'd wonder what good it might have done me. As I raced into the street, I was joined by Artisan, Shasen to the regent. My secretary had obviously sent for him upon first hearing this dreadful threat. Through the streets we ran, dodging between men and women who stared at us strangely, their army's general and a renderer of the will running together. It was a bad omen. Then we turned into the street of the orphanage. In my haste and concern, I threw the door open, unprepared and fearing what I might see there. In all my years leading men to war, and nights walking the fields of the fallen after the day's battle had brought them to their end, I had never seen so grim a sight as this. The warning had not been ill-founded. Here, lying upon the floor, were children, poisoned, as the terrible secret told. I wanted to scream, but I forgot about everything else as I thought about my little one left here some months ago. I started moving through the awful stillness, taking care to step around the bodies of these poor children. The chasen stooped to each child he passed, seeing if there were any that his healing touch might yet save. He moved quickly for an old man, panting through his own silent tears as he moved from one to the next, too late to render aid. Through this strange crypt, I swept quickly to the rear rooms where they held the nursery. Artisan followed close behind me. I had never known, nor ever will again, the kind of fear I felt in those moments. The last door on the left was open. A broad woman, the headmistress, collapsed across the threshold. A spoon and pot spilled out near her left hand. It appeared that she had either sampled the gruel or eaten first before seeing to her charges. I leapt over her fallen body, shoving the door back, and moved fast to the crib in the corner. The babe stirred, but sluggishly. I called to Artisan. The chasen moved quickly to my side and lowered his hands immediately to my child, whose lips still bore a small bit of the gruel. Too weak to cry, she drew rasping breaths. Artisan began to speak in a quiet voice, a soft light radiating up where he touched my little girl. Moments later, she drew a deep shuddering breath and smiled with her misshapen lips. She would live. Later, I would bring all of my influence to bear to find the villain who had done this evil thing but there were immediate concerns to attend to. In less than an hour's time, I was on the road east, surrounded by my six best men and riding beside the child's mother, a woman from the league I had lain with one lonely night. Several days we traveled, speaking little, until we came to the edge of the scarred lands, traversed its border, and found the tree they call the Forgotten Cradle. Like a collection of great bones, it stood white against the violet of the pre-dawn sky. I dismounted and walked my daughter to the tree where I paused and looked down at her, several feelings vying inside of me. I regretted already that I would not see her grow, more than anything else that I could not be a father to her, that my place at the head of the recitive army left no place in my life for anything but my duty. But beneath it all resided a hope I had not felt in a very long time. This child would know a hard life here, with a hard man. But the lesson she would learn here would hold her safe, as would Grant, the sentenced exile that cared for these wards of the Scar as he might his own children. I kissed her tenderly on her ruined lips and spoke my last goodbye. Then I placed her in the tree and removed myself to a hidden vantage where I watched the exile presently arrive, retrieve my little girl, and carry her away into the scar.